Grace is messy when you're a pastor with gay parents. You're going to enjoy today's show. Caleb Kaltenbach is the lead pastor at Discovery Church in California. Raised by gay parents and marched in gay pride parades as a youngster, Caleb experienced the hatred and bitterness of some Christians towards his family. He surprised everyone and became a pastor. Very few issues are as divisive as the acceptance of the LGBT community in the church today. As a pastor and as a person with family members who identified as LGBT, Caleb had to face this issue with courage and grace. His new book, Messy Grace, is a must read no matter what position readers take on the topic of sexuality and Christianity. Caleb and his wife, Amy, reside in Southern California with their two kids. Please welcome Caleb Kaltenbach. Hey, Caleb, welcome. It's so good to have you. It's great to be here. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. You have a new book out called Messy Grace. Yes, so, Messy Grace. <laughs> <laughs> I love the title. Thank so you. So right off the top, fill me in. Why did you write a book like this? I wrote a book like this uh, because when a Christian comes to Jesus, they realize that they have been messy, but it's like there's this insider gravitational pull that happens when you become a Christian and you realize that there's a whole big world of Christianity and you start going to all the conferences, the concerts, the Bible bookstores, the everything, which is good and we all need to do that. But we forget some of the times that, yes, we were once messy, the people around us are messy, and we move from a position of, of really loving and, and offering grace to people to a position of being intolerant and being people who yes. are viewed as judgmental. And uh, we begin to look more like the Pharisee than the tax collector. <laughs> you know, I, I often say it this way, Caleb. I say, some people think the church is to be a lighthouse. And what they mean by that is we should be an example of loving God, serving God, being obedient to God, having it all together yeah. so that we can show people how to serve Jesus. But everybody we're trying to reach knows they can't do it. Right. So they don't come anyway. No. So that can't be the church. The church needs to be messy, filled. Wherever there's babies, there's messes there in is. houses and homes. There is. I mean, I'm pretty sure that when Jesus called all the disciples, when he called uh, Paul, I'm pretty sure that they didn't have it all together. And yet, even before they believed, Jesus says, I'm a safe person. You can come into a relationship with me. He provided a place for them to belong before they ever believed. Were you always a Christian? No, I wasn't. Christian home? No, I wasn't. Funny enough, uh, my parents uh, were both university professors in uh, Missouri, and they actually uh, got a divorce when I was two, and they both uh, went into same-sex relationships. My wow. dad was very much in the closet. He had several different ones. I didn't find out about him until I was out of college or right around there. My mom, however, was in a 22-year uh, monogamous same-sex relationship with a psychologist named Vera. They moved to Kansas City. Um, they were activists. They joined the board of directors in that local area for GLAD. Took me with them when I was very young to uh, parties and clubs and pride parades. And this was the environment that I grew up in. So you grew up in the gay community. I did. And I grew up in the gay community learning something that was not true, but something that was exemplified for me, that Christians hated gay people. Tell me about that, because you were wondering about why people, because some people are so hateful. They are. I remember one time marching in this gay pride parade, and at the end of the parade, there were all these protesters holding up signs saying, God hates you, there's no room for you. And if that wasn't offensive enough, they were spraying water and urine on people at the same time. And I looked at my mom, and she said these words, well, Christians hate gay people. If you don't look like them, if you don't vote like them, if you don't uh, hold this political stance, you can't be a Christian. And I just thought to myself, there's no way I ever wanted to become a Christian. And uh, I ended up uh, really hating Christianity. And I saw it exemplified again and again, as I said. There was a, I remember a young man, who was a friend of mine named Lewis, was dying from AIDS and his Christian family, when we went to go see him, they were in the same hospital room. They didn't want to touch him. They didn't want to have anything to do with him whatsoever. Oh. And so by the time I got to high school, um, life was different. My worldview was out of control. I got invited when I was 16 to go to this uh, Bible study, and I thought to myself, this is going to be a perfect chance for me. So I'm going to go, and I'm going to act like a Christian. I'm going to pretend to be a Christian. I'm going to be a ninja Christian, and I'm going to learn about Christianity 
and then I'm going to dismantle their faith. I went, you got to understand, I had never been in a conservative Christian household. And so right when I walk in, the first thing I noticed, I said, why are there pictures of sheep and lions and a shepherd kid? And I turned to my friend. I said, is this part of the deal? If I turn Christian, I have to get a framed sheep picture? (laughs) It looked like somebody raided a Bible bookstore going in there, right? So I remember we went down and we were studying through 1 Corinthians. Everybody's reading a passage, and I was in 1 Chronicles. And uh, read a passage about somebody getting slaughtered. I said, that's not Paul. I said, where are you, Caleb? I said, 1 Chronicles. Oh, you're in the Old Testament. I said, oh, so there's a new one. Updated 2.0, I guess. I had no yeah. idea that there was even a New Testament. I just thought it was the Bible, Bible, you know, and that's yeah. it. But the more that I studied Jesus and learned about him, the more that I learned that he was not like the people on the street corners. Exactly. That Jesus had very deep theological convictions and very deep expectations for how you and I should live our lives. But he also had very deep relationships with people who were far from God, didn't see their need for God. And I knew that I would have to study and really learn what the Bible had to say about homosexuality, gender, same-sex relationships. And so I studied, and I came to this conclusion that I still hold today, actually two. The first one is this, that God designed uh, intimacy for the expression of marriage between a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. That was the first conclusion. And anything outside of that is not part of God's design. Right. But the second conclusion I came to is this, that a theological conviction must never be a catalyst to treat someone less. Ooh, that's good, Caleb. That our, so good. That if anything, that our love for God should really spur us on to love people more. I mean, are we not talking about the same Jesus who said in Matthew 5, 46, if you only love those who love you, what reward will you get? And Paul, who says in Romans 2, 4, don't you know it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance? And Romans 12, 18, as much as it depends on you, <laughs> live at peace with everyone. And I, thinking about the people on the street corners and in my friend's hospital room when he was dying from AIDS, they weren't really living at peace with everyone. And I gave my life to the Lord. If you can imagine how nerve-wracking it must be for a teenager who is gay or same-sex attracted to come out to their conservative Christian parents, I was a 16-year-old Christian teenager coming out as a Christian to my three gay parents. And they kicked me out. Really? Here's what I learned. That the more that I studied, the more that I learned about Jesus, the more margin I had to love people than I did before. And the more I could tap into his power to forgive the unforgivable. And uh, Beautiful. I ended up going to Los Angeles, California. I ended up becoming a pastor. I got married. We moved to Dallas, Texas uh, after 11 years of ministry in Los Angeles to go preach at a church. And the most amazing thing happened. My Both my parents moved there separately of one another to be closer to our family. Uh, My mother's partner had died without Christ several years earlier. And my mom had been with this woman for 22 years, you know. Um, So they moved down, and then they asked me to go to their church, to go to our church. And I said, you want to go to my church? You know what we believe. Well, yeah. But you know that this is what we believe about sexuality. Yeah. All right, come on over. And my church was nicer to them than I was. Isn't that wow. annoying when somebody's nicer <laughs> to your parents than you are, Leon? Yeah. Yeah, it's just a little bit annoying. And um, we moved back to Southern California to go past our Discovery Church in the summer of 2013. And two weeks before we moved back, both my parents gave their lives to the Lord. Oh, both man. Of them. That is awesome. And I asked them, I said, you know, what was it? I was expecting this uh, apologetics argument, theological, philosophical argument that convinced them. And they said, no, people treated us like people, not like projects. So it wasn't so much the doctrine as how much they were loved. I think people underestimate how much people base their view off God, off how you and I treat them. Yes. And when people treated them well, it really softened their heart to receive the truth of Christ. And I look at them, and they're just this really big, beautiful mosaic of messy grace. Because that's what the church is, right? The church is really a beautiful mosaic of broken lives that God has united together to glorify himself. And... I look at my parents, do they believe in Jesus? Yes. Uh, Do they love him? Yes. Are they saved? Yes. Do they believe everything I do? No. Are they still same-sex attracted? Yes. Are they in a relationship? No. Are they tempted? Yes. Will they screw up? Maybe. How does all this go together? I don't know. It's not my job to put it together. It's my job to teach love, point people to the cross of Christ. Let's take a break right here. And when we come back, let's talk a little bit about this because I think the church world 
it needs to kind of climb out of their little hole of, of condemnation and say, how do we bring God's love and his power into these situations? So if you just joined us, we're teaching from this book, Messy Grace. And uh, Caleb is our guest. And don't go away. We're going to be right back. We label people. We categorize people because when you have them labeled and categorized, it's easier to walk past them and not get involved in their lives and not ask the difficult questions. We believe Jesus Christ came to give every person on this planet a chance to live with power, passion, and purpose. Through award-winning, world-class TV programs like this and life-giving resources in Spanish, French, Italian, Russian, and Hindi, Spirit Contemporary is changing lives around the world. Considerable expenses are involved, but each person reached is absolutely worth the cost. People are saved, their faith revived, eternities transformed, all because of your support. With your donation today, you will receive today's special resource. With the help of technology, it is now easier than ever to connect with friends and family all over the globe. And for the first time ever, Springs Church is available to watch online. Get access to Spear Contemporary Church every single week. You'll enjoy great music and an inspiring message from Leon Fontaine. You'll even be able to connect with people from around the world. This is my personal invitation to join me on Springs Online. What would you say if I asked you what's missing in life? Like, how would your world change if you could access the miraculous, but in a totally normal and natural way? That's the Spirit Contemporary Life. You are designed to go into that business world and be better than anybody out there. In fact, let me just prophesy God's original intent is that every believer be at the top of the heap. Get up and live so big the world gasps at what God can do through a person. Welcome back. My guest today is Caleb Kultenbach with this book, Messy Grace, How a Pastor with Gay Parents Learned to Love Others Without Sacrificing Conviction. That's a great subtitle with that. So you and I are talking now. In this story, we've got your parents are in church and you just gave a list of things that are now going on. Yes, they love Jesus and have given their lives to him. No, they don't believe everything you believe yet. Yes, they're still attracted to the same sex. No, they're not practicing it as far as you know, but they might fall. Like some of those comments you're just making there, I think would bother a, a, a percentage of the Christian world because it's true. I don't like all the Christians I meet. No, I don't either. <laughs> I, don't, I, I see some of the things they do, some of the things they say. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll have a, a panel on a talk show and bring on really well-spoken Muslims, really well-spoken, uh, and then they bring the dumbest talking Christian they can find, put them on there, and I'm going, come on, my kid can defend the faith better than that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Absolutely. And uh, so there's just, there are. There, well, the sad fact is there are Christians out there that I'm embarrassed of. Yeah, I am too, because we, you know, Jesus calls us to be fishers of people, and yet we want all of our fish clean cut, prepackaged, very easy to deal with, and I'm sure you've gone fishing, and I remember the first time I went fishing, mm -hmm. and I remember the first time I learned that you had to clean a fish, and it was not with soap and water, nope. it was with a knife, and it looked like a B-rated horror movie, <laughs> and you get messy when you it's fish. Messy. And you look at who Jesus spent his time with. He spent his time with the tax collectors, the Roman centurions, the, the quote unquote sinners, uh, you know, forgave adulterous women, for, talked to the woman at the well, offered her hope. I mean, he surrounds himself with all these people that the religious culture and secular society would not have concerned themselves with. Don't you love that? That love Jesus it. not only swims up against religious culture, but also society at the same time. It's true. I, I like comparing it to a family. Like I've got five kids. And I mean, when they were small, our house was a honking mess. I mean, if they're not wetting their pants, they're pooping their diapers. If it's not that, there's toys everywhere. If they haven't done that, they dump their porridge all over the kitchen. Where you've got a family, you've got a mess. And the younger that family is and the younger that person is, the messier it gets. 
So that's why I like messy churches. Because if it's a perfect church, it means we've got all, all these mature people, no babies coming in, no new converts. Because every person that gives their life to Christ has got a ton of stuff to walk in and, and believe in. So why do we pick on the gay community as though that's a very unique sin and it's different than every other sin and it's, and it's worse? Like, really, where's that in the Bible? I think that we don't like to um, get deeply involved in people's lives. We label people, we categorize people, because when you have them labeled and categorized, it's easier to walk past them and not get involved in their lives and not ask the difficult questions like, um, who are you? Where are you from? What is your life like? Uh, what, what is your beliefs? What are your hopes? What are your dreams? We don't have to get to know people. but. What I've learned is that love has no exception clause. There's no exception clause whatsoever. And people are deeper than the way we treat them. Like, I remember this one conversation I had with my mom one time. And I don't know how it came up. I didn't bring it up. She did, just to let you know. <laughs> but uh, it was before her partner died. It was before my mom accepted oh. Christ. And she said, she said, you know, Caleb, uh, Vera and I, we haven't been sexually intimate for years now. You know, first of all, gross. I don't care who your mom is. Nobody wants to have that conversation with their mom, right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't. <laughs> nobody, you know, that was brought by a stork, you know, not by anything else. Every kid wants to believe that. That We want to believe that. Yeah. But um, I looked at my mom when she said, we haven't been sexually intimate for years. And I said, so you're not a lesbian anymore. And she said, well, sure I am. Those are my people. I have relationships and acceptance and forgiveness. I'm part of a cause and a movement. And I said, mom, you just described the church. And she said, no, I didn't. Why would I go somewhere where people would shame me and make me feel less? And it really dawned on me at that point, Leon, that for my mom, it was more about an identity. And so many Christians think that people identify as LGBT because they want to have sex with somebody of the same gender. That's not the biggest reason people identify as LGBT. It's the hmm. relationships. It's the acceptance. It's the emotional connection that they have with other people. Yeah. I know a lot of same-sex couples who are together, and they're not even intimate anymore. And they've been together for years because the emotional bond is so there. And so many people are afraid of loneliness, yeah. both opposite sex attracted and same sex attracted. And so here's what usually happens. The average Christian Joe over here will meet uh, somebody named Tommy who's in his office and cubicle and so on. He realizes that Tommy's gay. And so Joe develops a friendship with him and figures that in a short amount of time, maybe seven, because seven days, that's God's number. Right? We'll just say seven days, maybe 14. He's got to figure out how to share what the Bible says about homosexuality with Tommy. Because obviously Tommy probably has no idea what Christians think about you know, homosexuality in terms of what the Bible says. And so he develops a pseudo relationship with Tommy. Tommy thinks that he's earning a new friend until one day unloads all these verses on him. Unloads of Leviticus and Romans 1 and 1 Corinthians 6. And all these verses that you and I would agree with, they're true. But Tommy's thinking... You don't know who I am. You don't know my upbringing. You haven't taken time to get to know me. You tell me not to define myself by my sexual orientation, but because you haven't gotten to know me, you've actually reduced me to my sexual orientation yourself. Right. There's yeah. the irony. And Tommy walks away feeling hurt and probably further away from God than he was before. Joe walks away feeling like a justified martyr. Well, I lost the relationship, but it was worth it. No, you were a moron. Yes. You were a moron because are these verses true? Yes. But maybe we should take time to get to know people for who they are and help people identify with Christ. And as they begin to identify with Christ and as Christ impacts their work life, their family life, their relationships, God gives margin for conversations on holy living in the future. But Very we don't good. like it because it's hard work, right? Yep. Isn't it hard? I mean, you're a pastor. You know that. Yep. You've had people in your office. I've had people in my office where we just want to say, you know what? If you just stop sinning, that'd be great. <laughs> just stop it. Yeah. It's very true. You know, so many Christians, they like you very well said, they have this timeline in their head that by here, you should have everything dealt with and be a good Christian. And then it means that you've dealt with all these issues. But good Lord, I mean, some of the people I've seen walk into our church, number one guy, this is literally no lie, had a wife with kids, had a girlfriend with some of his kids, and then another one that he was now dating. He, had, he owed the Hells Angels drug money. He had broken into a building and was now wanted by the cops. And he was going to go to jail. And he's addicted, porn addicted, drug addicted. We want him cleaned up by Friday. We do. Absolutely. <laughs> this guy's going to take a few years just sorting out his women issues, his legal issues. How's he going to get to church? For I mean, 
yet he's given his life to Christ. I want our church, and I'm sure you're the same way, to be a place where we give the person margin and God margin to figure out what is their next step with Christ. Yeah. Wherever they are in their journey with God, whether they're on this side of the cross or this side of the cross, what's their next step? and give them the margin, give God the margin and the time to be able to work in their lives without demanding perfection. But again, we don't like that because it's tense. And yet Christianity is filled with tension. We're not willing to own that. No, I had a man one time say to me, he's, he, we, were, we were talking and he's a well-established Christian and a wealthy businessman in our community here. So he says, you know, he says, Leon, he says, like I've often thought about coming to Springs. I mean, I, Wow, it's quite, quite amazing what God's doing there. He said, but you know, he said, like, the people that attend there, I, I don't mean to be judgmental, but, and I forget the words he used. It was kind of like trailer trash, messed up people, you know, and, I, and he, he wanted to be where he could have rub shoulders with the people like him. Mm. And uh, I said, I looked him right in the face and said, you just paid me the highest compliment you Absolutely. could. Absolutely. I said, because that's where Jesus would be. It is. <laughs> and what is John 1? 14 and 17 say that Jesus came full of both grace and truth. And truth. That, that he provided a place, as I said before, where people could belong before they believe. Yeah. You know, and, and, and not pronouncing salvation, but saying, yes, you can come be a part of this. And I often look at it this way. People don't like to live in the tension, but, you know, there's a lot of power in the tension. But people think that there's power in taking sides and either being all about the grace or all about the truth. Like some people will say, you know, I'm all about the grace over here and I love God and God is great and God is good and their version of God is Buddy the Elf. You know, and it's weak, it's flimsy. It's like holding a rubber band on just one side. But then there are people who are all about the truth and they love the Lord and they love Jesus so much they even put extra syllables in his name as Jesus <laughs> when they pronounce his name. And, you know, but it's weak if you're only about the truth. But look, if you say I'm about the grace and the truth, where's the power? It's in the tension of the two. And it's not like our theology isn't already tension-filled. We believe in one God, but the Trinity. Like, that makes sense. Jesus is fully God and fully human. Yep. The Bible is written by God and by people. God is completely in control, but we have free will slash responsibility. So don't tell me that we can't have tension in how we love people if there's tension in our theology and what we believe every day. We're already living in that tension today. So well said. That is so true. There, there is no way that the church can change people. We have a little saying in our church and we just call it, if you're coming to our church, we want you to know our culture is called laugh, L-A-F. And it means to love or value people immediately, to accept them the way they are, as messed up or as perfect, whichever they think they are, and then just to forgive each other when we hurt each other. And that's the culture that allows church to grow. Because you so well said, I'm not called to clean them up. Um, we've got to be able to love people. And people don't, people don't, I, I, I like that old saying that when you talk to someone, they're not going to remember what you said. They're going to remember how you made them feel. Mm. That's what they remember about you. Mm. And I think if Christians could remember that, go and love. And they're going to say, well, Leon, they're not perfect. But they're, they're really messed up. So are you if we really examined your life. There's still going to be stuff with you that you, God's working on. So let's just give each other some grace. Caleb, thank you for being with us today. This thank you so good. much. Absolutely. My guest today has been Caleb Kaltenbach with Messy Grace. I think it's a book you need to get and read. We'll be right back. Devoted, a daily devotional created with you in mind. Easy to read and simple to understand. These two-minute faith boosters are available in eight different languages. Watch it on YouTube or have the booklet sent directly to your home. You can also receive Devoted to your email inbox daily. Become inspired as Leon Fontaine shares practical biblical teaching. Devoted is literally at your fingertips. Transform your life with this spirit contemporary devotional. Sign up to receive Devoted today. Wow, what a great show today. Caleb Kaltenbach made some really great points on how the church can show the love of Jesus to the LGBT community. You know, Jesus was the best example of this kind of love. He accepted and loved everyone he met, no matter where they were at.
This is a huge part of being spirit contemporary. You see, Jesus had favor with God and he had favor with man. It didn't matter if he was talking to a person from any walk of life or from any area of failure in their life. They were attracted to Jesus. He had no condemnation for them. He would look at them with love. He would even spend time with them and be with them. And this is so important to the cause of Christ. In fact, I want to encourage you to be spirit contemporary. You know, for a gift of $30 or more, you are going to help us to get the gospel of Jesus Christ out there, but not in a condemning, condescending way, in a way that is so loving, so accepting, that it causes people to open their hearts to Jesus, and then real change and real miracles can take place in their lives. For a gift of $30 or more, you are going to see people's names written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You will, for a gift of $30 or more, you're going to see people who have given up on the gospel hear it in a way that touches them deeply. And if you could go to your phone right now and give that gift, I want to send you a gift to say thank you. It will be a resource that will teach you and equip you to move in the things of God, to understand how to be spiritually alive to the point of receiving and seeing miracles flow through you, but at the same time to develop the skills of being contemporary, relevant, where even Jesus, it says, had favor with God and favor with man. I believe this resource will help you ramp up your favor with the people around you. They'll even seek you out. Thank you for giving. We appreciate it so much. God bless you. We trust that you are being blessed, uplifted, and encouraged in your Christian walk through today's program. As a viewer, you should know that we care about you. We value you greatly and appreciate your prayers. Did you know that Miracle Channel is taking the good news of Jesus Christ around the world through award-winning programs like this? We are actively translating ministry programs into languages like Spanish, French, Italian, and even Russian. We even air on television stations in the Middle East. This means that millions upon millions of people are hearing about Jesus Christ in their language, and it's all thanks to people like you. Considerable expenses are involved, so we need your support, because each person who gives their life to Jesus is absolutely worth the cost. Each is of infinite value to God. You are very important to us. We care greatly about your spiritual growth which is why we would like to get today's resources into your hands. When you support this program by making a donation, you are not only enriching your walk with the Lord, you are sharing Jesus with someone on the other side of the globe. Your donation transforms lives by reaching literally millions of people with the gospel. Call now and change someone's life today. Tomorrow on The Leon Show, um, so I think as people stop hoping, um, oftentimes on the flip side of that, they start kind of trying to control things. And then the tighter you try to control something, <laughs> the less you find yourself hopeful. And you can't be curious about something that you control.